Hi right, guys. I wanted to talk a little bit about groundwater contamination. Uh, it is an issue uh, that can be quite a problem uh, because remember, we're using groundwater for a lot of different purposes, um, obviously mostly for irrigation, but also for public use. So uh, human beings are pulling the groundwater out and using it for drinking water, for bathing, etc. And if there's anything in the groundwater that is uh, contamination of some sort, it will come out in your drinking water and in your uh, bathing water, etc. So these are all examples of different things that can contaminate the groundwater. And essentially, all you really need is for this stuff to spill out onto the surface. Uh, so gas stations and oil uh, tanks, uh, that stuff can get into the ground and contaminate the groundwater. Most of the time, it will float on top of the groundwater, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But that can be a major problem. Landfills. Um, urban runoff, leaking sewers, industrial storage that contaminates the land, pesticides that you might be using in your backyard to make your grass look nice. Okay, um, These are all issues and they're all problems that lead to contamination in the ground. Now, my wife was a hydrologist before we had uh, kids and she worked for an environmental consulting firm. I'm going to interview her and ask her a few questions. Uh, before we do that, um, I wanted to show you guys a video uh, from a USGS uh, professor down in Texas who talks a little bit about different sources of contamination. Um, and she talks a little bit about what's called karst topography. Karst topography means lots of limestone, which tends to leave a lot of seams in the ground. So anyway, uh, this is just a video about contamination. You'll get to hear from my wife, uh, who is an expert. And uh, that's pretty much all I wanted you to, to hear about, OK? You can kind of imagine if you most aquifers you could think of as a big sandbox and the karst aquifer you'd think of maybe as a block of concrete that you'd cracked and then dissolved out some some tubes through it a system of, of tubes and if you were to pour something poisonous like a pesticide or an herbicide or some other type of contaminant on top of those two systems that it would move really slowly through the sand grain aquifer and some of it would stick to the sand grains and some of it would get filtered out whereas in the karst aquifer it would just be funneled or focused into those zones of what we call preferential flow those pipes going through the rocks so in karst aquifers there's this very important interaction between what goes on at the surface and what goes on underground because they're so closely connected so really anything that we use at the surface it's going to find its way underground and it's going to find its way underground quickly and it's going to move through the underground very very quickly to come out at springs one category of contaminants are pesticides insecticides herbicides things that we put on our landscaping and our gardens and our golf courses to try and control weeds and try and control pests well those things are by design toxic they're, they're meant to kill things uh, so they are contaminants and whenever it rains they wash off the surface and they go into the groundwater system and they can move very quickly sometimes in a matter of hours from the surface to come out at Barton Springs. Um, another category of contaminants uh, that we're all familiar with are things like gasoline. Gasoline spills and oil spills also leaking from underground gasoline storage tanks. Those can enter karst aquifers very quickly and can cause contamination that can move through the system in pretty much the same concentrations that we find them at the surface, they could come out the springs. I, guess I just wanted to um, give you guys some information about a career in uh, the field of hydrology. And conveniently enough, um, I have my wife sitting next to me and I can ask her questions about what she did because she was a hydrologist before we had kids. And uh, so I just wanted to ask her a few questions. Um, by the way, I know the answers to all these questions. I'm just asking them for the benefit of you so you guys have an idea of, of what you might want to get into in the future and, and just the idea that this is a possibility uh, for your future. Um, so, Rachel, just a um, quick first question would be, what do you major in? Where do you go to school? Um, and uh, then I'll ask you a little bit about your research. Um, I went to school at University of Evansville, which is where I grew up and I majored in environmental science. And then I did my master's at ESF and I did hydrology there. Cool. Um, what was the, uh, your thesis, your master's thesis on? 
So I was working in Nine Mile Creek and we were tracing the interaction between groundwater and streamwater. Um, that stream has a lot of uh, little groundwater springs coming into it. So we were using temperature and the contamination um, that, that was in, in the stream, um, kind of the same uh, as what was being put into the lake, like, you know, over a hundred years ago. So we were using the contamination and the temperature to trace the groundwater coming into the stream. Why would temperature be useful for figuring out where groundwater is coming in? Uh, so the groundwater is a lot colder um, than the stream temperature, especially obviously in the summertime. That's when I was doing my research. So you can like feel the difference in the stream? Yes. Yeah, so if you're standing in the stream, you could kind of feel the colder spots. We knew there was a section where um, there were a lot of little groundwater springs. And so that in that section, you could really feel the kind of cold spots. And we were embedding temperature sensors um, in the stream bed and then leaving them there. And then we could take them out later and um, look at the temperatures and see uh, where specifically the little springs were. Cool. Uh, what did you do after college? Um, I started working for an environmental consulting firm uh, called EA Engineering. And so we did a lot of different work, mostly with um, groundwater. Uh, so mostly um, contamination, groundwater contamination, um, like from, uh, like, um, what's the word? Laundromats? Well, yeah, laundromats, a lot of laundromats, um, and like from a really long time ago. And then also a big project up at Fort Drum where there was a um, big jet fuel spill. What were you doing at Fort Drum? Um, so we were working on a, a very slow, long cleanup process. They had uh, spilled, there was a leak in a jet fuel tank underground that leaked for nobody really knew how long. And they finally discovered it and there was just... Basically, it was like, uh, you know, feet of jet fuel um, kind of sitting on the groundwater, like under the soil. Um, so we were working on kind of mapping the um, extent of the contamination and then, um, you know, working on slowly kind of pumping some of that out and doing other remediation um, techniques. So just to give you guys an idea that the, what she's describing is jet fuel sitting on top of the water table. So that's above the saturated zone. So just in your head, if you want to think about that uh, feed of oil or, or jet fuel on top of, of the water table underground and how far down was it, do you think? Oh, I forget. Like 40 feet, I think. Yeah. So it's pretty crazy to try to clean that up. Obviously, it's a major process. I think they're still doing it as far as I know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, also, you can't think about groundwater as like a it's like a pool underwater. It's not it's not like that. It's you know saturated soil. So and same thing with the jet fuel. Is you know the soil is saturated with the fuel. Yeah, perfect point because I mentioned that the other day, guys. So she's describing the, what the water actually is underground. It's not like an underground cavern or anything like that. It's it's just saturating the soil. Um, so if you were to you know go back into it after kids. Um, you know, once our kids are in school, is the possibility you'll go into the environmental field or science field or, or anything like that in hydrology? Mm. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I didn't honestly really love consulting because I wasn't doing a whole lot of science. I was mostly just doing grunt work. Like, so if you like, you know, being outside doing field work, um, it's a, you know, good place to be. I think as you move up the ladder, you maybe do more of the science, but I didn't really get that far. Um, so I don't know if I would go back into that. Um, uh, definitely something environmental. And, and I really do like hydrology, but I don't know if I would do consulting. Perfect. Thanks.